my comments with regard to Abel by faith and Cain and the offering that he brought as a tiller of the ground is that everything in God's word, as we've said, with regards to faith, is faith is always a right response to God's revelation. So what made Abel's sacrifice acceptable to God, according to Hebrews chapter 11, is that it was a sacrifice that he brought by faith. I'm simply emphasizing the fact that what Abel brought was a sacrifice by faith. By faith always, meaning something that God revealed, God required. And the inference to that is, in chapter 4 and verse 3, and in process of time. In other words, at a certain point in time that God appointed. Now, having said that, in chapter 3, we remember that Adam, when sin came in, dealt with it by sowing fig leaves together and made aprons to close himself. That is contrasted with what God does at the end of the chapter. And what God does at the end of the chapter is he clothes the man, doesn't he? And he clothes the man with animal skins in order to make provision for man to be in the presence of God. So God's dealings with sin in chapter 3 and how God went on to deal with it in providing Covering for man is consistent with the way that Abel comes in chapter 4. It recognizes and owns what has been revealed up to that time. Man has sinned. Blood needs to be shed. And so his offering is an offering, again, back to faith in God and consistent with what God has already revealed. So that's Abel. Now, with, um, and I say this for continuity. In other words, chapter four is not contradicting chapter three. Chapter four is flowing out of chapter three and of things that have been shown in chapter three, consistent with God's dealings with sin. God made full provision. Provision was found in God and God alone. Abel, by faith, came in full dependence on God's way, God's provision, God's declaration. What you have then with chapter 4 in the building of these societies and these civilizations, by Cain himself, is a denial of the fall. In other words, societies built with man finding acceptance based on their capacity to till the ground. And tilling the ground, spaceships, rockets to the moon, technological advancement, all potential of the ground, man tilling the ground. Look how great we are. That finds continuity and goes on. Man wanting to build a name for himself. So it's going to repeat itself at Babel. It's man, let us make us a name. How? By brick, mortar, building, uniting humanity for one global purpose in denial of the fall. And in denial of what God says that without the shedding of blood and without faith, it is impossible to please him. And in the end, the whole thing will come to self-implosion. Now, having said that, at the end of chapter four, where you have uh, that men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Well, chapter three, God comes out and calls out to Adam, where are you? Where are you? God's still calling out to man. God's still calling out to man. God's still calling out to man. So men begin to call upon the name of the Lord. Why does God allow those societies to go on like that? And I believe these principles will find, again, repetition 
in that sense. Further on in scripture, when God then in this book tells Abraham that, listen, uh, uh, you're not going to inherit, but you, 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 you're going to die. You, you're going to go. You're going to go to your forefathers, and, uh, uh, and your descendants will be slaves in Egypt for 430 years. And then will I bring them in? <laughs> but why? Because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full, and so. God, why does God allow it to go on? Because God's wrath and God's judgments are as much a part of his glory and perfection and his character in their perfection as his mercy and his grace and his salvation. And God himself is not willing that any should perish, but that men should come to the knowledge of the truth. How do you ever bring people to the knowledge of the truth if, like he said, when Cain first sinned, what did God not do? He didn't zap immediately. He warned them, listen, you're on a trajectory that is bringing you deeper and deeper and deeper into the stronghold of sin from which ultimately, unless that's reversed, there is no recovery. And Cain defies that, and not only defies that, murders the evidence, direct opposition to the evidence, and then proceeds to build his paradise without God for the good and the glory of man without God. And the whole thing self-employed and closed. But why does God allow it? Well, not only because his wrath will not fall until every opportunity for salvation has been exhausted and rejected, but he allows it as what Joshua encounters when he sends the spies into the land of the Amorites right before Abraham's descendants are brought in. And what does he find? Rahab. And what did Rahab say? <laughs> I've converted to the living God. Why did I convert to the living God? Well, I heard what God did to the Egyptian, what God did to Pharaoh. Oh, thank God for it, is it? And God uses it. And when you come to the call of Abraham, which is simultaneous with Babel and that post-flood global rebellion against God and man making a name for himself, simultaneous with that, you've got a man like Abraham who, well, if you think it through, he saw, he came from those great civilizations on the other side of the flood. He, he, he saw they were flawed. And why were they flawed? Because they were built on man without God. They were civilizations that were built without owning the reality of the fall and that the only one who has a solution to the problem of the fall of man is God himself. And so Abraham, in that sense, was sick of the idolatry, was sick of the lie. And he could see it, and people can see it. And we're in a day that it's applying to us, even as we're seeing the iniquity abounding everywhere and the tremendous chaos that's going on in society. And parents who are not believers like we are, freaking out over what they're teaching their children about all this chaos and transgenderism and, and, and sexual change and operation. And, 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 and they see the whole thing with its great advancements with the great luxuries and things that we enjoy that man can build, but the thing is flawed. There must be hope somewhere outside and beyond man. And that hope lies with back to God and his promised seed. So that's what I wanted to uh, add to the thing about continuity. What Abel does, is if in Genesis 3, the problem was giving up faith in God, the answer to the problem and God's solution to that problem will bring back man's heart to faith in God. And faith in God at that highest level of his solution to the problem of sin.
when God clothed the man and the woman in Genesis 3, it required the shedding of blood, animal blood. When Abel brought his sacrifice, it was by faith, by faith in God's solution to the problem of sin. How God dealt with it in chapter 3 is consistent with the sacrifice that Abel brought in chapter 3 by faith. You're going on in the five? You said you were going to have okay. your part on five. Well, five. I, my part in five is that we're entering into the third creation story. And so uh, we looked at the first creation story. And in Genesis 1-1, when we had the word, the generations. Uh, but in Genesis 1-1, you don't have the generations, but you have in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So that is a story about creation. When you come to chapter 2 and verse 4, now you have the beginning of the second account of creation that's given to us. And there is, these are the generations. And what was that word, Toledo? How do you Toledo. Pronounce? Yeah. So uh, these are the history of, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. So the, the, the structure of the book, the book itself is telling you He's giving you a story of creations. When you come now to chapter five, um, you have, this is the book of the generations of Adam. And so we have the word again, in the day that God created man in the likeness of God made he him. So you have the marker that tells you this is another account of creation. Now, what's important is to understand what is each one emphasizing, and I hope that that's coming out uh, more and more. But when we come to this one, uh, it says, uh, verse 2, male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. So this is going to be the, 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 the creation of Adam. And like Keith was emphasizing later, we're not dealing here with Ish. We're dealing here with Adam. This is the human race. This is mankind. This is what man is. And so uh, he called their name, not just his name, but their name, human being, is what we're saying here. Both the man and the woman. He calls their name Adam. Adam lived 130 years and began a son, a son in his own likeness and after his image and called his name Seth. Now, I think that that's important because we've got now man created by God. Adam was created in the image and likeness of God. But now Adam, fallen Adam, fallen man, reproduces and when he reproduces he produces a son in his own likeness after his image and i think we all understand the problem don't we? all men have sinned and all men have come short of the glory of god but now we're trying to look at and consider what man has become not only what man has become because of sin but how that has affected how man and what man was originally created to be. And so this section has to do now with uh, uh, the development of the human race from Adam, its constitution, the constitution of mankind, man's constitution. Why do we get that? Well, you have a, a history here of Adam. And this is the first time that you're going to have death by natural causes. That has never happened before. Now, we know that, obviously, Cain killed Abel. But that was not a natural cause of death. That was a sacrifice. By the way, the word for Cain killing Abel is the same word that's used for slaughtering sacrifice. And so here you have Adam and Adam lived 130 years, began the son in his own likeness after his image, and called his name Seth. 
And the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years. That's a long time, isn't it? And that's a long time with things going on. I mean, you get used to living like that. We get used to living like that. I mean, you know, we live, what, 70 years, maybe 80 years. Imagine what it was for this man to now live 900 and some odd years. But all of a sudden, there he is. He lives 930 years and he died. That never happened before. He never experienced that. And that brings in a reality for all of us. Unless the Lord Jesus comes, you're going to die. I'm going to die. What's going to happen to me when I die? It's the really the most important question in the whole of the Bible, isn't it? You're going to die, you know. It is appointed unto man once to die. And after this, the judgment, you see. Now, the sting of death is sin. The problem of sin. And so here's the problem of sin. And Adam lives 930 years and he died. And then it goes on, and Seth lived 105 years and begat Enoch. And now we go to verse 8. All the days of Seth were 912 years, and he, he died. And, 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 and that keeps going and going and going. These are the generations of Adam and of the human race. And then uh, verse 11, Enos lived 905 years, and he died. And he died, verse 14. That's uh, Canaan. And verse... Uh, 17, Mahaliel, he died. And uh, verse 20, Jared lives 962 years, and he died. And Enoch lived 60 and five years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years and Enoch walked with God, and he didn't die. What does that mean? And, and why is that recorded there? And what does that say about the human constitution? And he did not die because he walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And then it continues on, and Methuselah lived 187 years and begat Lemek. And Methuselah lived after he begat Lamech 780 and two years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Methuselah were 960 and nine years, and he died. And Lamech lived 182 years and begat a son. And he called his name Noah, saying, This saying shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands. And this is interesting. Because of the ground which the Lord God hath curse. So now we have continuity, don't we? And you can imagine that toil of Adam and something that we, I don't think we properly said it, but in chapter four, the difference between God's cursing of Cain and how God dealt with Adam is, with Adam, he said, cursed is the ground for thy sake. But with Cain, it was different, wasn't it? Cain's sin was thou art cursed from the ground. And that's a horrible thing because they were, and the purpose for the creation of man was to till the ground. And now in Cain's judgment, cursed are thou from the ground. He is from ever barred from the blessings or benefits or potential that can come from the ground and tilling the ground for the purpose for which he was created. And that is hell. What an existence that will be in hell, where all that is of God, and all that is of God in his purposes for creating man, and even in our day, and in our world, and in that day, God is still present here, and tremendous benefits are still at play here in man's ability to till the ground and till the ground. But yet, 
for that man came, never, ever would he in any way enter into the experience of life in the reason for which he was created. Perishing, an, an eternal state of perishing without hope forever and ever and ever again. What a horrible thing that is, isn't it? And so uh, uh, we come to this verse 29, and he called his name Noah, saying, this saying shall comfort us concerning our work and our toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. And I see here an inference to the hope of the resurrection. And the wonder that in this world where the ground has been cursed as a result of human sin, which we saw in Romans chapter 8, how the whole creation is subject to vanity. Oh, thank God for the wonder of this provision of God in that day of Noah. With that rise and the increase of those evil societies that have filled the whole earth. And then when we come into chapter 6 and we remember that word tampering, tampering. And how in Genesis chapter 3, it was Satan, the serpent, that subtle, cunning beast, tampering, tampering, tampering. And in chapter 6, you have the intrusion now into the human race with the daughters of all men, this coming in of this demonic infiltration to pervert the human race and to form of the human race the superhumans, the superheroes, so to speak, that would become men of renown, men of such exceptional physical and apparently intellectual aura, charisma, power, qualities that mankind would worship them. And it would feed that whole spirit of man being self-sufficient. Man being independent for God and man being able to achieve his purposes of creating a paradise for himself, all in rebellion to God without owning the fall, the sin against God and receiving God's provision for that sin. So um, going there back to Noah in, in, in the flood, and this will come out as we come along. But in Noah, that horrendous toil of the ground and how the scripture says in Romans chapter 8 that the whole world, the whole creation groaneth in anticipation of the revelation of, or the manifestation of the sons of God. The glorious liberty of the sons of God when all creation through that work of redemption in the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, would experience relief and deliverance from the horrors of the disciplines of the curse that is on the ground. And with the call of Noah, that seems to be an inference there through that ark, which God would provide all of his wisdom in order to save man, preserve the human race, and so to speak, bringing that ark and men in that ark, those eight souls, through that judgment, into that judgment, and then once the judgment passed out of the ark into a figurative resurrection life in a world with judgment passed. Thank God for the hope that we have in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, going back to this, uh, uh, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. And it will be tied into, in chapter 6 and verse 3, that verse that says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always abide with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. That has to do 
with the constitution of man. Man is both spirit and flesh. So when Abraham lived 932 years or 30 years and he died, if you'd been there and Abraham was sitting in his chair, like I'm sitting in my chair, and all of a sudden he died, what does it mean that he died? His spirit and his flesh died. His spirit and his flesh died. But his flesh will corrupt, correct? Decay. And yes, in that sense, he, he will die physically at this point. Abraham, Adam had died spiritually. Adam was dead in his trespasses and sins spiritually back in Genesis 3. Correct? But he had not died physically. Why had he not died physically? Because even though he was spiritually dead, now notice, he wasn't intellectually dead, he wasn't emotionally dead, he wasn't morally dead, he wasn't uh, psychologically dead. Huh? He, he was spiritually dead. In other words, he was separated, or like Ephesians chapter 2 says, he was alienated from the life of God. Yes? But now he was spiritually dead. But now he lived 930 years. And he died physically. How did he die physically? What happens when we die spirit, uh, physically? The spirit. You don't have eternal life. Yeah, but the spirit that's in you. It goes back to God in that sense. It goes back to the wherever, Hades or wherever. It leaves the body, doesn't it? So the point is that the human being is both spirit and flesh. And the problem of sin is that man, in that sense, when he rejected the word of God, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Man shall not live by food alone, but by every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. So that now Adam lives 930 years and he died. If you'd been there, you'd still have Adam. I mean, yes or no? no. <laughs> but, but, but you'd still have his body. It's, you'd still have that body, which was Adam. There he is. But this is something that had never been. That, that's exactly right. We're talking about man's constitution. Man is not just flesh. In fact, when you come to chapter six and uh, God makes his pronouncement here, uh, look at verse three. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is what? Flesh. Flesh. So when man sinned, he gave up that spirit and he chose flesh. And in dying spiritually, in that sense, man became flesh. That kind of flesh that's bad flesh. In other words, man succumbed to that animal part of him. You and I have a body, like animals have a body. But what is it that sets us apart from the animal world? It's the spirit that's in you and the spirit that's in me. When man sinned, when man did not live by every word that proceeds, comes forth from the mouth of God, man in that sense became flesh just flesh he died spiritually but now we're dealing in chapter five with mankind the constitution of mankind when god created mankind he created mankind both spirit and flesh now that has ramifications with the angelic world what did the angels think their spirit being and now, here's this unique creature called a man, 
had never been one like that before. And man was also a spirit being. Yeah. But he wasn't just a spirit being. He was also flesh. So now here is Adam. And Adam lives 930 years and he dies. What does it mean he dies? Let me take you to uh, uh, a couple of passages. One is 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. In fact, before I go to 1 Peter chapter 3, let's go to Psalm 104. And this is tied to, we're in chapter 6, I know we're going through 5, but we're tied to chapter 6 and verse 3. My spirit shall not always strive with man, because he is flesh, yet his day shall be 120 years. Now in Psalm 104, when it says there in, in, in Genesis 6, 3, my spirit shall not always strive with man, what has been usually said is that that's speaking of the Holy Spirit. And that what it's saying is that the preaching of the gospel is going forth and God is calling out to man and, and God is calling out to man and uh, his spirit will not continuously keep striving with man and provoking man to believe the gospel and come to God huh? and be careful with sin, be careful with putting off the decision to be converted because my spirit will not always strive with man and there will come a point where the spirit of God will stop striving with you if you refuse and you reject and you'll find yourself, you can't ever believe, you can't ever come to God because God's spirit, Holy Spirit, doesn't strive with you any longer. Now, is that true? Yes, it's true. But is that what Matt, uh, Genesis chapter 6, verse 3 is saying? No, that's not what Genesis chapter 6, verse 3 is saying. What Genesis 6, verse 3 is saying is that God is not going to allow man to go on living as he's living in his perversion, in his corruption, and his being just flesh forever like that. It's not going to go on forever. And so in Psalm 104, to try and get a handle on this, it says, uh, verse, let's read from verse uh, 29, Psalm 104, verse 29. Thou hidest thy face, they are troubled. Thou takest away their breath, they die, and return to their dust. Thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created. And thou renewest the face of the earth. That's the spirit that God breathed into man, into his nostrils, the breath of life. And man became a living soul. So this is the spirit that God has created and given to mankind, to human beings. You see. That spirit, obviously, is represented by the breath of life. It is the spirit that God has given to man. In James, James will address that issue where he says in chapter 4, let me read it to you. Uh, James chapter 4. Let's just go there for a moment, please. And notice the character of James chapter 4 is worldly. In other words, it's rampant flesh, rampant adultery, spiritual adultery, which is what? Taking all that life has to give without any loyalty to God himself. And so he says, you ask and you receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. Verse 3, you adulterers and adulterers, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? And that is a complicated verse. But what it's saying is, that it's God who longs 
for the spirit that's in us. To belong to him. It's God who longs for the spirit that it's in the heart of man, you see. And God himself, how much does he long for the human spirit to be loyal to his spirit? He sent his son, didn't he? He sent his son to recover us, to give us new life. And certainly at conversion now, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is linked to eternal life. But the human being, his constitution is at creation. God gave him a human spirit. In Hebrews chapter 12, when it talks about the disciplines that we're to submit to, it says, we all had fathers according to the flesh who disciplined us, and we gave them reverence. How much more shall we submit ourselves to the father of spirits? Not the Holy Spirit, but the father of all spirits. In the angelic world, and of every human being who has ever been born on this planet, how much more shall we submit ourselves or yield ourselves to the Father of spirits and, and live? So what God is saying in, in, in Genesis 5 is he's referring to the human constitution. I don't understand it all, but in between the and he died, and he died, and he died, how did that death take place? He stopped breathing. The spirit left. Well, you still got Adam sitting there in his body, but but in that sense, he's not there, is he? And this is something that had never happened before. And what happens? Separation of the spirit. And the body. Absolutely. But what, then, what happens to you? What happens to me when we die? We're all going to die. The ramifications of it, you see. You move on to judgment. With, with the Lord Jesus, we don't, do we, in that sense? Thank God for that. That's the wonder of it. That's the wonder of it. You know, where is the solution to death? But already then, even at that level of Genesis chapter 5, all after these, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died, you have Enoch. And Enoch was not. Well, wait a minute. When Adam died, there's the body. But, but, but like, like he said, but, but where's Adam? And, and what happened? But with Enoch, there is no body. The whole person is gone. And he's gone because God took him. Took him alive without dying. Which says... That the way that man was originally created, man was in his flesh, earthly, wasn't he? And could live, and we've all lived on this planet. But right from the early stages of Genesis, God revealed man could live and exist outside of earth. And he could live and exist in the realm of Spirits, yeah, because man is spirit. And the problem is that man became flesh. And God said, this perversion of what man is, which will go into chapter six and so on, he's not going to allow this to go on forever. And so human beings die Put out of the garden, lest he take of the tree of life and live physically forever in that condition. Okay. And then now we're headed into the flood. And that will bring in ramifications. You see, my spirit shall know over all this thing. And Noah and the ark. And, 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 and how did God destroy that world of man that became flesh? How did it become just flesh? Because man did not live by every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. Man rejected spirit, rejected light. Now he's left to flesh. And God ultimately will say to mankind, have it your way. You want to be flesh? You don't want spirit? I'll take the breath from you. And he destroyed that world that then was by drowning it. 
And what happens when you drown someone? If I take you, I put you underwater, hold you there for half an hour, and then I pull you up. What have I got? Take my breath. I've taken your breath away. And I've got your flesh. And what happens to human flesh the moment that breath leaves the nostril? Corruption. Oh, thank God for a man who came into our world and did not see corruption. And had the Lord Jesus to this day still been in the grave, huh? his body still would not have seen corruption. Thank God for that incorruptible man it's being born again, not of corruptible seed that perishes, but of incorruptible seed by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Yes? So now, we got to land the plane. We got to land the plane. First Peter chapter 3, and we'll go there for your own consideration for a moment. And this is Peter now talking about um, uh, the flood and the New Testament com comment on the flood. And I'd like you to read, please, uh, and, and tie this with Enoch. And again, he was not. God took him. And we're going to read from verse 18 to verse 22, of 1 Peter chapter 3. But I want you to focus on verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Now, this is the line. Being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the spirit. What does that mean? <laughs> Christ has also once suffered for us for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh. How was he put to death in the flesh? He, dis he dismissed his spirit. <laughs> He's man. He's fully man, you see. Yes? Wonderful, isn't it? And how was he quickened? And raised from the dead. <laughs> His spirit. We keep reading. By which also he went. And preached unto the spirits in prison. Which I believe. Are those spirits. That are mentioned in Genesis chapter 6. That came in to corrupt the human race. Which sometime were disobedient. When once the long suffering of God. Waited in the days of Noah. While the ark was a preparing, wherein few that is eight souls were saved by water. The light figure, whereunto even baptism does also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a, a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from, well, obviously the dead. Verse 22. Who is gone where into heaven and is on the right hand of god angels and authority and power being made subject unto him oh thank god for the one of our lord jesus christ bodily human still gone into heaven and he being the hope of the future of mankind and the fulfillment of the purposes for which God originally created man in the first place. That man might reign with him. Angels, authorities, and powers being made subject unto him. Amen. Let's give thanks. Go ahead, Henry. You got a mic on. Father, we're grateful for the man in the glory who is perfect and not subject to corruption. 
who is immortal and who has shared this immortality and incorruption with us mm. through faith in his gospel. Amen. The good news that we can be saved and made like him. We pray for the food. Thank you for the sisters serving us. And just pray that we'd have good conversation to thy glory over the meal. In the Lord Jesus' name, amen. Amen.